Praise the Lord. We're having an awesome service here this morning. Uh, we're going to finish 23 strong, and we're looking forward to a new year and all the awesome things God is going to do next year in 24. It's, um, it's kind of an exciting time, and um, I wanted to uh, encourage you today, if you want to get your 2023 giving statement as, you know, as high as you can get it for your tax returns or whatever, you know, whatever uh, reason there might be, uh, this would be a great opportunity. We could use your help here at TNJ to finish strong financially also. Um, so I encourage you to give generously. We got our live stream audience here too. Y'all can give online and so can the live audience online in person. Uh, we have a box in the back. This is just a, a work of the Lord. And when you're sowing into something God is doing, you're going to get blessed. And I know a lot of you could give testimonies. We do that from time to time. But uh, the Lord will bless you when you sow and give generously to something precious that he's doing. So I um, encourage you to do that as well. Um, we... Um, uh, well, I, I wanted to say that, uh, you know, this is the cold and flu season and uh, it used to be pretty normal, but now people kind of freak out about that. I don't remember it ever being quite like that. I guess since the, the pandemic, uh, people have gotten that way. But I uh, uh, last Saturday, uh, I realized I didn't feel good last night, uh, Saturday night after service and and it hit me, uh, I was just in bed for a couple days, which was kind of cool, actually. Just sitting there watching football games and, and uh, documentaries about Alexander the Great and the Roman Empire and stuff that I'm into. Um, but I just, I feel fine now. A, a, a doctor told me, give it five days, you won't be contagious. I'm past that. But just in an abundance of caution, I'm not going to shake hands or hug you because I love you too much. I don't even want to take that chance. Um, just in an abundance of caution. Um, so don't get offended if I <laughs> put my hands up like this or something. I'm not going to shake hands or, or hug today. But I want you all to hug and shake all you want. Uh, just not with me. <laughs> I sound okay though, don't I? You know what, after you, you've been sick for a few days and, and you sound kind of nasally, sometimes that lasts for a week or two. Um, but anyway, um, praise God, it's a little cold today, but I love this weather. I don't know about you. Um, I think it's beautiful. It's a beautiful time of year, the most wonderful time of the year, as, as the, the song says. Um, but uh, I think 23 has been a great year, and I just want to give thanks to God for Blessing Temple New Jerusalem this past year. We've seen a lot of new people come in. Uh, he moved us to this new location. We didn't see it coming, but wow, this is great. It was, yeah. As soon as we got in here, we were like, yes, Lord. We, we see now what this was all about, and it's been great. And We've already uh, had a lot of new people come, and, and we're excited about what God is doing here in Tarpon Springs, Florida. We're a congregation of Jewish and non-Jewish people who are together as one in Messiah for the end time restoration of Israel. And so, you know what? Uh, we're going to continue now with something that the Jewish people have been doing for a long, long time. We're going to process the Torah. The Torah is the word of God, so we process the Torah with a lot of joy because we love God's word and, and Symbolically, we kiss the Torah because it's just a symbol of our love for God's word. We don't actually worship the Torah scroll or anything like that. God forbid that would be idolatry. Um, there's a lot of symbols in the Christian world as well, if you haven't noticed. <laughs> and uh, people don't necessarily worship them. Uh, it's, you know, things are symbolic. So we have the, uh, the Torah, which symbolizes God's word. And guess what? It's written on skins. And the word of God became flesh 
and dwelt among us. That's what uh, Yeshua did. He was the Son of God sent from heaven to be born of a Jewish woman in Bethlehem. He became one of us, not just to walk among us and, and teach and, and do miracles. And he did all that in demonstration of who he was, but to go up to the tree, the cross, to give his life for the sins of the world. And whoever believes in him, you've got the greatest gift. You've got eternal life because he's removed your sins. Just like death had no power over him, it has no power over you either. Death and sin are washed away, and, and in comes the, the Holy Spirit. The reason the Holy Spirit is here, because we believe in what Yeshua did at the tree. He abolished not the law, he abolished our sins. The law is still there. The law testifies against you. You know, it says sinner. <laughs> he said, don't think I've come to abolish the law. He didn't. But he abolished the penalty. He abolished your sins. He paid the price for your sins. So that the enemy has no power over you. Just like the Spirit of God lifted him up out of the jaws of death. Death couldn't hold him down. It can't hold us down either. So anyway, uh, we're going <laughs> to process the Torah now. I do have a message to share later. That was a pretty good one, though, wasn't it? <laughs> Page 63 and 64. Sometimes I get a little carried away. Page 63 and 64. As the ark is opened, we're going to rise together. In the English first. When the ark were traveled, Moses was saved. Arise, O Lord, and let your enemies be scattered, and let them that hate you flee from you. For from Zion will go forth the Torah, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Blessed be he who in his holiness gave the Torah to his people Israel. <laughs>
Genesis, and uh, we're going to be reading from Genesis 50, verses 1 through 3. That's Genesis 50, verses 1 through 3. Yamo David ben Michael la Torah. Barhu et Adonai Hamborah, Baruch Adonai Hamborah Leolam Vayet, Baruch Adonai Hamborah Leolam Vayet, Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech Haolam, Asher Bachabanu Mikol Haamin, Venantalano et Torato, Baruch Ata Adonai Notena Torah. Amen. Amen. Vai Paul Yosef al pene aviv, vai vechelav, vai shachlo, vai tzav Yosef et avadav, et harofim, lachanot et aviv, vai achantu harofim, et Yisrael, vai lulo. Arbaim yom kichen yim lu yemei hachanutim vayivku oto mitzrayim shivim yom. Amen. Genesis 50, verses 1 through 3. Joseph fell upon his father's face, wept over him, and kissed him. Then Joseph commanded his servants, the physicians, to embalm his father. So the physicians embalmed Israel. They took 40 days for him because that is how long embalming takes. And Egypt wept 70 days. Amen. Aruch Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Asher Natanalu Torat Emet Vachaye Olam Netap Tocheinu Baruch Ata Adonai Notena Torah Amen Amen Mi Shveach Avoteinu Abraham Yitzchak Yaakov Yavarech Et David Ben Michael B'Shem Yeshua HaMashiach May he who has blessed our fathers Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob Bless David, son of Michael, in the name of Yeshua. Amen. Amen. I want to tell you all that David, you're not going to see him for a few months. He is leaving next week for a study abroad program. You know, he's a seminary student. And uh, he's going to study abroad at, at University of Oxford in, in Oxford, England. Uh, which, you know, we're, we're all happy for you and excited that you got into that program and have that opportunity. And, and uh, just uh, 
keep him in prayer, and, and we'll just send you off in the name of Yeshua with God's mercy and grace, and may his angels be upon you to watch over you, keep you safe, and keep you in the right places, doing the right things, and filling your mind with wisdom and your heart with Yeshua's love. In his name we pray. Amen. As we return the Torah back to the ark, the Etz Chaim prayer, page 73 and 75, Shoshana is going to lead us again, page 73 and 74. In the English first. It is a tree of life to those who take hold of it, and those who support it are praiseworthy. Its ways are ways of pleasantness, and all its paths are peace. Bring us back, Lord, to you, and we shall come when your days as a whole. It's high in life, but never let yourself be, be defeated. Does that make sense? You'll face many defeats in life, but don't let yourself be defeated. So we put on the mind of Messiah. Doesn't 1 Corinthians remind us to put on the mind of Messiah? And be of good cheer. And Yeshua said, I have overcome the world. So we're heirs to the kingdom. That's the best news of all. So we have this beautiful gift of grace in our lives that he's bestowed upon us. But when we put on that mind of Messiah, we're able to have peace that passes all understanding, that deep, deep shalom, deep inside. No matter what's going on in the world, we will overcome it as believers in the Lord and those and be a light and a witness in the world, in the perishing world, right? So I wanted to share that little tidbit with you all today because that's what was on my heart. And um, just briefly, um, kids, if you could be dismissed to your class right now, that would be fantastic, ages five to 12. And parents, please follow your child out because there is a sign in and sign out procedure and they're gonna have a great class. So enjoy children, I'll be back in a minute. Remember, we have Davidic dance class the first of every month, and if you're in town, if you're out somewhere and you happen to be in the Tampa Bay area, visit us here in Tarpon Springs. Dance class the first of every month after Oneg on Saturday. So you'll learn basic steps, maybe a dance or two that goes with this beautiful music. It's open to everyone, and um, it flows much better when you come to dance practice uh, before just getting up and just going. And uh, we'd love to see you there. 
beginner's Hebrew class today. At, there is Miss Olga, who's going to be teaching it. Thank you, Miss Olga. It's a wonderful, wonderful Hebrew class, and I know y'all are learning a lot. So that starts at 1 p.m. for 45 minutes following One. And um, there is a delicious cake we have today for David. So it's a sweet send-off cake for a sweet tooth and a sweet person. <laughs> so go, go ahead and grab some food afterwards. We have a good nosh to follow. Um, women's class, we do not have class this coming Wednesday evening, January 3rd. We are going into, I think it's lesson 19. So please read it before we hop online to review lesson 19. It's a wonderful journey from growing in wisdom and faith. And it's just been just revelation knowledge for our heart, getting through some things with life, back to the scriptures, helping us. And um, it's just a really good study. So for you at home, you, it's never too late to just come online and you can call the office for details. So let's start the new year right this year. This is going to be the best year yet. Amen? amen. Let's hear a big amen. amen. That's right. God did not give us a spirit of fear, but of love and power and a sound mind. And we go in ringing in strong. For 2024, there's going to be a lot happening. And the best news of all is, let's be free to worship in spirit and in truth to our creator, who made us to begin with in the first place, to praise him. And remember, um, for those of you who have gifts and talents, which is every single one of you here and every single one of you at home, everybody is a gift and talent. And if you'd like to get involved here at Temple New Jerusalem, please, please do. We have cards to fill out called Temple Builders, building the house of God block by block, um, soul by soul, talent by talent. And it's wonderful. You see there's a setup crew, a cleanup crew. Uh, there's a card with a list of things. There's outreach. Um, there's Oneg. So there's Sunshine Group. So please get involved in something and use the gifts and talents God's given you. Remember, back in March, we, um, we have our Quorum Spiel, directed by Olga, and um, it's going to be fantastic this year, our Quorum celebration, the Feast of Esther, celebrating the victory, and, you know, remember, be, you know... If you want to participate, please sign me afterwards. <laughs> okay, did everybody hear that? Miss Olga said, those of you who would like to participate, please see her after... Uh, services today and she will fill you in on the details and get some information for you. Thank you, Olga. And uh, remember, if it wasn't for Queen Esther's courage and, his faith, and her faith, Messiah never would have been born. So we have to really praise God for that because of her courage for such a time as this. And um, there is a little gift uh, when we have our God Day, God is Love Valentine's Day theme. In February, everybody always gets a little gift, and that's a little kiss from God here from Temple, New Jerusalem. And if it is your birthday, happy birthday, December birthday babies. And for you at home, if it's your birthday, happy birthday. Uh, enjoy being another year of healthy living, enjoying your healthy life. If you got out of bed this morning and you breathed in some fresh air, you're doing okay, right? I bet everybody can name three things already how God blessed us today, already. Many, many more to come. And um, there's information on the back for you about our mission statement, Jewish and non-Jewish people together in Messiah for the salvation and restoration of Israel. So now, for a very power-packed message from your rabbi, Rabbi Mike, thank you so much. As you can see, they're having a little uh, problem with the uh, 
the visual up there, it, it like it, it go, keeps flickering back to this screen. I hope that doesn't distract you, uh, but um, you know, just don't pay too much attention to that. <laughs> so anyway, uh, today I want to talk about power, and not power as the world knows it. You know, they talk about power in the world a lot, but. But the power of God, which is what overcomes the power of this perishing world. And it's important because just before Yeshua left the scene, he spoke to his closest disciples about power. Luke 24, 45 through 49. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. Can we pull that scripture up? Luke 24, 45 to 49. Let's see if they can do it. Uh, and he said to them, so it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day. And that repentance for the removal of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending the promise of my father upon you, but you are to stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. So the power of God came as the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is the power of God. The Holy Spirit is the miracle working, yoke breaking, supernatural power of the Lord. But it came to them because they knew and believed that as it said, that Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day. They knew and believed in what he did at the tree. Suffering and then dying and then rising from the dead. All for the removal of sin for all who believe. That's how and why the power, which is the Holy Spirit, came to them. Yeshua is sending his spirit in proportion to our faith in his finished work. So easy to get off on rabbit trails, looking for spirituality, for the Holy Spirit, spiritual things. But the power is in his victory at the tree, because that's how and why it comes. That is the plain and simple truth. And although this fundamental truth it's quite simple. It's easily forgotten and given up for more interesting things. Uh, you know, I um, published a book a few years ago, and it's called The iPath, and it's a collection of stories that are, though fictionalized in part, they're based on true stories and characters. I often share those messages at conferences. You've heard me do it. Many of you have. And once in a while, I do it here. I'm going to do it this morning. We're going to have a little fun this morning. I have to warn you, um, you know, and, uh, and I'm working on a volume two, as many of you know, I'm not quite finished with it yet, but I've already started sharing some of the material and uh, I'm going to do that today. I'll also be at, at the uh, International Rabbis Conference from Sunday to Wednesday and I'll be sharing some there as well. But first, I need to give you some background because we live in the Clearwater, Florida area here. You know, we're in Tarpon Springs, and this is Tampa Bay, and, and uh, this side of the bay, Pinellas County, is often considered the Clearwater area. And it's known for our beautiful beaches, sunny skies, great vacation destination, incredible place to live. I think it's one of the best, Pinellas County is one of the best places to live in America. But also... I'm preaching to the choir on, on that one. <laughs> also, it's known for one of the largest religious movements ever in the history of America, something called the Clearwater Virgin Mary. <laughs> Many of you know what I'm speaking of. If you've been here since the mid-90s, you could hardly not have heard of it. I don't mean to disrespect anyone's faith uh, in talking about this. We don't believe in praying to the Virgin Mary. We, we pray to God. And Yeshua is, is the Son of God. 
the Holy Spirit, the Father, one God, three persons, the apostles and the mother of Jesus, they're not, they're not God. We don't pray to them. Uh, we don't believe they're doing anything for us. If they are, then I'll take it. But uh, some people do believe that. And in any case, it was an incredible phenomenon among those people uh, who were all around the world. And not, it started in 1996, just a few days before Christmas Day. Uh, a man walking down the street contacted the local news because he noticed some kind of a stain that appeared on the glass windows of an office building on US 19, a major artery in Clearwater, which served as the home office of Seminole Finance Company. Now, the stain was 60 feet tall and 20 feet wide. But it wasn't just a stain, it was the Virgin Mary. Uh, and I wonder if they can pull up those pictures. <laughs> the local TV news, there's one right there. With, you see all the people and you can see that. Uh, uh, yeah, and that one. <laughs> the local TV news came out. They did a story and boom, immediately the thing went viral. And after uh, just a few weeks, over a half a million visitors, 500,000 visitors, just a few weeks, flocked to the site, mostly Catholics, but a surprising number of evangelicals also got in on the action. The city literally had to install portable restrooms and sidewalks, and a team of local police officers, dubbed Miracle Management, was assigned <laughs> to help with traffic control. Countless millions of people continued to come for years until finally in 04, a teenager shattered the glass with a slingshot, removing the head of the image, leaving only the body, which is still there to this day. He did 10 days in jail for that. Millions of people came, but it was just an image on the side of a building. There was no power in it. The power of God is not available to us through an image. I probably don't have to convince anyone here. I'm not sure. But to worship an image on a building is idolatry. And it's kind of an obvious kind of idolatry, I think. And yet, still millions of people flocked to it with the idea that some, there was some power in it, and there wasn't. But, but even so, even if you understand that, by nature, we are inclined to, uh, to images. And, and not necessarily images that are outside to see with your eyes, but more commonly, especially for people who understand that that's idolatry, more commonly is the image of ourselves. And it's very subtle, and it's easy to get trapped in it. It's, it's the human condition. It's our fallen state. The Greek myth of Narcissus expresses it very well. He was he was completely enamored with his image and, and he couldn't receive love. He couldn't love anyone else. He was paralyzed by it. But he didn't really realize it was his image. And that was the thing about that myth, which expresses uh, deeply, I think, the human condition. Whether it's through delusions of keeping the law, which I think is the most common thing, or about superior intellect, or prophetic giftings, or oratory skills, or being a great warrior in prayer, or judging other people for their flaws. Um, you know, these could be um, uh, virtues or vices. But even among the virtues, we can have a tendency to think, look how great I am, look how smart I am, look how holy and observant that I am. Look how I pray, look how I speak. Listen to me, look at me. I'm really a great one. 
I really have God's power. And, and yet it's an image. Because the gospel tells us that the power of God comes to us not through what we do, not even what we do for God. Which is, I think, where a lot of people get stuck on legal issues. They think, uh, well, if I, if I change my diet so that I don't eat in cert certain restaurants that serve kosher food, like I don't eat kosher, I don't eat unkosher food, but now I'm not even going to eat in restaurants that serve it. Then I'll have more power with God. If I am a little bit more observant of certain uh, festivals, and I'm all for observing festivals, and I'm for kashrut and, and keeping the Shabbat, and I wear these, but although not all the time, and maybe someone might think I know guys who do this. They think, oh, I'll just wear tzitzit all the time. I'll attach them to my belt loops, and I'll go around at work 24/7. That's fine if you feel called to do that, but don't think you're going to get power from God doing that. That's not where the power is. Yeah. Romans 1.16 says, For I'm not ashamed of the good news. I'm not ashamed of the gospel, Paul said. He was an expert in the law. Why is he not ashamed of the gospel? Because it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. The gospel, or good spiel, as it was formerly called in Old English, the Besorah in Hebrew, is the power of God to all who believe. It's a, it's a story, it's a spiel, a good one, telling us what Yeshua did for mankind at the tree. Hmm. So someone will say to you, you've got to die to self. Well, I say to you, who's going to do the dying? <laughs> and this, is, this goes back to the being trapped in, your, in your, the image of yourself, the, the image of righteousness, the image of holiness. And the idea of the death of self, you know, Paul said the old man must die, the old self must die so that we can be the new self. So if... If, you're gonna, if you are going to die to yourself, who's the one who's going to do it? You're going to do it. But the thing is that the last thing you want to do is die. <laughs> so you is never really going to get rid of you. You is going to pretend he or she is going to say, oh, I got rid of myself. Look at me. I'm dead. I'm gone. I died to self. But you is the one who's who, who is proclaiming to have done it. Have I confused you, or, or does that make sense? And so that's how it is that we're stuck because me can't get rid of me. I can't get rid of I. You can't get rid of you. And yet Yeshua taught us that unless you take up your cross and follow me, you're not worthy to be my disciple. And I think he was trying to teach us something there. You're not worthy to be my disciple because you're not going to do that. If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. You're not going to do that. If your right arm, cut it off. You're, you're not going to do that. He didn't mean to do that. He was always bringing us to the end of ourselves so that we could see we're stuck. Our only hope is in salvation. Someone's got to come and get us out of this mess. And that's what he came to do. So he would try to show the, these paradoxes of how human beings are a fallen race. We're stuck and we're in need of salvation. But we always want to save ourselves. We always want to think, well, I know I got saved 30 years ago, but now it's on me. Look at me. Look at all the stuff I'm doing. I'm, I'm much holier now than I was then because now I'm doing this and that and, and I know all these things. But it all goes back to what he did at the tree. That's where our righteousness comes from. And the Holy Spirit, the power of God in our lives, Amen. sanctifies us, transforms us. Oh, it's so important to keep that straight. Romans 1, 17, he says about the gospel, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written. The righteous shall live by faith. 
So it was about 10 years after the Credence Clearwater Revival, <laughs> as I like to call it, the, uh, the Virgin Mary movement ended. It was a time where I was feeling a bit discouraged. Um, it had nothing to do with, with, the, with that movement, but it was just, we'd gone through at that time, now this would be about like 12 years ago, more or less, we'd gone through at that time, oh, a betrayal, and we'd lost some people, and anyone, if you've been in the church or synagogue scene for a while, you know the, that those things happen from time to time. And, and so uh, it can be a little heartbreaking, a little discouraging, and looking back now on it, um, it was really the best thing that ever could have happened, but it never seems that way at first. And the attendance was down some. And so I was praying and hoping uh, that the Lord would give us a season of harvest, that he would give us a shot in the arm, something to give us a boost, bring in a fresh new harvest of people with, with the upcoming uh, Sukkot festival that was coming up, by the way. And it was in preparation for Sukkot at that time that Tara was lifting and moving some tables to help get ready for our congregational Sukkot festival, which would be at the end of the week uh, during uh, Simchat Torah for the Shemini Atzeret, which is at the end of the Sukkot festival. So she's moving this table. I don't know how she did it, but boom, she accidentally smacked her arm right here on the corner of the table. Now, Tara is a fair-skinned lady, and gosh, just the slightest bump, and she bruises. And so it was uh, the next morning, we woke up, and it was a Sunday, and I took a look at her, I couldn't believe what I saw. I literally jumped out of my seat. I said, oh my God, what, she said. I pointed to that thing on her arm. I said, ah. and she said, okay, it, it's a bruise, calm down. I said, that's not just a bruise, it's the Virgin Mary. Look before we lose the picture. <laughs> Maybe they can pull it up one more time. Something didn't want us pulling up these pictures. I don't know if it was God or the enemy. <laughs> oh, there it is. You see? Yeah. She had the Virgin Mary. Yeah. The Virgin Mary appeared on her arm. So it was the Clearwater Virgin Mary had reappeared and relocated to the right upper arm of my wife. Tara Stepakov. I got down on one knee. She didn't think that was funny. She probably liked it though, but I immediately took a picture and posted it to social media. And a few hours later, that picture had gone viral. <laughs> Not as viral as the thing on the building, but viral for us. And I was really having some fun with this. And I'm like, we could call the local news. That's how the stain on the building thing started. Imagine the turnout we'd get at Sukkot. <laughs> and after that, who knows? We might need a miracle management team. <laughs> and porta potties and the whole world will be coming, Tara, to bow down to you. She's like, you're insane, it's just a bruise. And I said, people can decide for themselves what they think this bruise is. I say, let's get the word out. <laughs> a stain on the side of a building drew millions of people. Why not your arm? So. Uh, now, uh, going back uh, uh, a few days before Tara smacked her arm on the table, I was at Starbucks getting nowhere on my book that I was writing, and 
I met this Lutheran pastor, which is, a, there's a Lutheran church right across the street. I don't know much about uh, the Lutherans or anything, and, and again, anything I say is all meant in good fun. I don't mean to disrespect them or, or anybody, but the guy, um, he wears a priest collar, and it seems to me the Lutherans are very much like the Catholics. It's almost like Protestant Catholicism, yeah. but I don't know much more about it. And first, I, you know, I want, to, I want to say I used to hang out at a lot of the Starbucks in my neighborhood. And, and, and that Starbucks, this may be true of a lot of them, is like a microcosm for the religious scene in America. Uh, every conceivable religious group holds meetings at this Starbucks. Uh, there were, of course, the ubiquitous churches and their groups. And, of course, they were all competing with one another. Um, the men's groups, the women's groups, the, uh, uh, you know, the um, just all, all different kinds of groups. You had the Calvinists, you had the Arminianist groups, and they, some of them were multi-congregational, and they were trying to draw people uh, from the different churches. And then there was the Jewish group from the Reformed Synagogue which was mostly LGBTQ uh, people, frankly. Uh, they were wearing their rainbow t-shirts and uh, so forth. And then there was a Zen group, which frankly was mostly Jewish. <laughs> I think they were even more Jewish than the reform group. And there was a variety of, of Eastern meditation and yoga groups. And, um, and there was also a, a, a group there called the Pantheists. Like they believe like everything is God. And there was a, a quasi-Christian group in opposition to the Pantheists called the Anti-Pantheists, which was led by this lady named Pam, who was a fanatic. She's kind of a cult leader, in, in my opinion. And I, I call her Pam the Anti-Pantheist. But <laughs> that's for another story. I'm not going to be able to get into that this morning. I was there, a total misfit, in a corner by myself, drafting a book, now volume two, and everyone was suspicious of me. A Jew who believes in Jesus, no. That doesn't fit. The Christians think I'm still under Jewish law because after all, Jesus, Jesus supposedly abolished the law, but I still identify as Jewish. The Christians uh, feel that way, and whereas the Reformed Jews there think I've broken Jewish law, even though they've totally reinvented Jewish law, and the non-Christians, uh, they think I'm just another religious fanatic out of touch with the flow of the universe. So I like to be like that because I found that as part of the creative process, the um, just being in this this cauldron of religious controversy and, and is there was something about it that was inspiring. And, and also uh, at times it gave me the ability to engage with other people. And I, when I write books, I need to engage with other people, like people that are not the kind of people that I would normally engage with. Sometimes weird people. Because it all leads me back to this, that Christianity has said the Torah is abolished. Reformed Jews have created a new Torah altogether. The Eastern mystics say it's not about law, but about looking within and finding yourself, but they're all wrong. Yeshua said, don't think <coughs> that I've come to abolish the law. I haven't. <coughs> Excuse me. In fact, your righteousness must exceed even that of the Pharisees. And there's only one way to be that righteous. As Yeshua taught us through his sayings and phrases and stories and teachings, that the gospel is the power of God unto all who believe. <coughs> because in it, is revealed the righteousness of God. So the power is not in abolishing the law. It's not in observing the law. 
It's not in finding your inner self, but it's in what Yeshua did at the tree. <coughs> Excuse me. Poor Nancy. <coughs> Get me a hot, <coughs> hot cup of water. Woo! Straining my voice. I always have one on me. L'chaim. <clears throat> so, yeah, there we go. Back to this Lutheran pastor <clears throat> who I met there. Ain't you going to call me Habibi? I'm good now. <laughs> this Lutheran pastor from this church across the street, he asked me <clears throat> if I had a dog. I said, sure. His name is Skippy. And uh, he knew that I'm a Messianic rabbi. He asked me <clears throat> if I'd ever heard of a bark mitzvah. <laughs> it's a real thing. They have them, especially in Beverly Hills. They're really popular. And it gets people out to the synagogue. So that in a culture less interested in God, dominated by uh, giant mega churches where religion in America is being centralized, uh, which trends back to the medieval times, really. <clears throat> Smaller religious institutions are getting desperate. They have no power. So they're coming up with clever ideas to try to get the people out. And this guy, uh, he had heard about the bar mitzvah and I think some other things, and, and this Lutheran church was struggling. So he told me how they doubled their Sunday attendance once a month by having a monthly service where people could bring their dogs. They had a flashing neon sign that said, all dogs may go to heaven, but not all dogs may go to church. Join us for a positive service, giving glory to man's best friend. Cute phrase, isn't it? <clears throat> Seemed interesting to me. I said, I think about it. Maybe bring Skippy over. And uh, so <clears throat> that Sunday that Tara smacked her arm, Excuse me. It was raining. <laughs> hey, Rob, can you come up here and talk for about three minutes? I'm so sorry. I've never done this. And I don't think maybe once in 30 years, but I have to take a pause. So, we've all survived Hanukkah, and we've all survived Christmas with work and friends and all that, and there's a new year coming, which, according to no religious calendar means anything, but is a tremendous thing for a social calendar year. And I have no idea where I'm going with this conversation. Um, but it does give us a chance to reflect and think about where we are and where we're going. Um, next month, I'm going to be 64 years old. And I've been practicing medicine for a long time. 
And so I'm thinking, Kimberly and I came down here almost two years ago to, for a job. We never would have thought that we were gonna leave for Philadelphia. We've been in Philadelphia for 30 plus years. We have five children, almost all of whom live up there. Our four, our four and a half grandchildren live there. Um, our fifth grandchild is coming in March. And I was not real happy with some of the things that were going on with the job I was at. And somebody came and they introduced me and they said, we you know, want to give you an opportunity to do what you're doing plus some of the stuff that you used to do. And I said, well, that'd be interesting. And they said, and I said, where? And he said, Newport Richie, Florida. And I said, where? <laughs> um, so we prayed about it. And it was very obvious from everybody, to, our, to all of us, well, to everybody except me, that this was God working in our lives. So we moved down here and we came here. And now as the new year approaches, you know, things are sort of strange sometimes at work. They, I, they, again, one of the things that I was not happy about in Pennsylvania was that the multi-office medical practice that OS had sown out had, had been sold to private equity and private equity, which is basically interested in turning money out and paying private equity people back, was driving the bus. And one of the reasons to come here was this was a physician-owned practice. Well, guess what happened? They sold to private equity. So now private equity is driving the bus. So as I am thinking about where I'm going with my career and when I'm looking at not retiring, because I can't imagine retiring, but going to a less than full-time employment opportunity. And when that's gonna happen, which may not be for a while or maybe next week, depending on how pissed off I get at my employer. <laughs> um, <laughs> we all should be thinking about where we're going. Where is God having pointed? Where are you gonna get a conversation or a phone call that's gonna change direction? Not to make you leave here, I'm not telling that, anybody that. Um, but something that's gonna change your direction spiritually, something that's gonna change your direction socially, something that's gonna change your direction in your job, in your family. And that the important thing is that all has to be subject to God. And it all has to be subject to the Lord's leading. And sometimes the lead, Lord leads strange, like having me come up in three minutes of filler. Um, but we really do need to be considering that and praying about that every day. So there's my thought for the afternoon, for the morning. Are you ready to get pastor's dog service. Uh, it was a Sunday morning and we woke up and I saw the thing on her arm and I, we usually took Skippy to the dog park where they let the dogs run free and they, he can interact with other dogs. So it was rainy. So I said to her, why don't we go to this church dog service? Skippy can <laughs> interact with some other doggies and it'll be interesting. Now, I, I have to say things didn't go well at the Lutheran uh, dog service, and what happened was that Skippy was reprimanded by this guy that <clears throat> they called the church rector. I called him rector the corrector, but he, uh, he reprimanded Skippy for... Uh, how shall I say it? Sexually inappropriate conduct in church. <laughs> now, <laughs> I don't know why dogs do that. And Skippy is usually a perfect gentleman. Um, could have been something about that church that caused him to lose his composure. I don't know. In any case, even though he's neutered. Nevertheless, Skippy acted inappropriately. He had a moral failure. 
<laughs> right there in the sanctuary. And unfortunately, that kind of thing is contagious, so pretty soon the other dogs are <laughs> engaging in the same conduct. But Rector, the corrector, he only corrected Skippy, as if Skippy started, and I took it kind of personal. I thought maybe, you know, because he's a Jewish dog, <laughs> and we know Martin Luther wrote some really bad things about Jews, maybe just blame every problem on the Jews kind of thing. I don't know if that's what it was, but the uh, rector, the corrector suggested if we could not control Skippy, he'd have to uh, miss out on receiving the sacrament at the end of the service. Believe it or not, they do a canine communion. And uh, rector, the corrector apparently felt Skippy was somehow not worthy to receive it. So I don't know uh, what it was really all about, but this wasn't working out, so I said to Tara, you know, let's skedaddle. And she had now taken off this button-up sweater uh, because I guess she'd gotten warm, and as she was putting it back on, right then, Rector the Corrector looked at her arm and said, what's that? And I jumped in immediately and said, it's the Virgin Mary. <laughs> and the dude started crossing himself. And I was really just having some fun, but um, they, um, they take the Virgin Mary and, and all that quite seriously, apparently, uh, as Catholics do, and I guess Lutherans do as well. Again, I don't mean to disrespect, it's just, I was just having some fun. And, and apparently the Lutherans were very involved in supporting and promoting the Clearwater Virgin Mary phenomenon that had ended 10 years earlier, but many were waiting and hoping, believing that Our Lady of Clearwater would come back. And now she had, on the arm of a Messianic rabbi's wife. People started gathering around Tara and uh, you know, rector, the corrector called some people over. And someone said, "Hail Mary, full of grace." And 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 then, uh, you know, I'm like, she bumped into a table and got this bruise. But then, voila, the image of the Virgin appeared. And and before we knew it, there was this crowd. And many of them were crossing themselves. I, Tara says, I exaggerate, but I thought I saw someone with tears. And uh, they were all taking pictures. And what do you know? Skippy was deemed fit for communion after all. <laughs> and Rector, the corrector, apologized to Skippy. Personally saw to it that Skippy got one of the communion treats, which was dipped into a chalice of, I think, holy chicken broth. And Skippy just gobbled it right up, and we were on our way. Later that day, Tara was getting calls and text messages, and she was all over uh, social media, locally. Lots of people were seeing it, as well as my post, which was meant tongue-in-cheek, but a lot of people don't understand Jewish humor and took it seriously. And a lot of the people from the church, they really were serious, I think. So about a week later, we did have a very nice Sukkot celebration that year, on the eighth day. But somehow, despite all the interest and enthusiasm that people showed over the Virgin Mary on Tara's arm, Somehow this did not result in a significantly greater amount of people showing up at our event or at our synagogue afterward. A few days had gone by and the image smeared and after a week it was gone. Of course there was no power in it. 
Now, I had a lot of fun with that incident, and we still laugh about it. But not long after that, our congregation grew quite a bit. And we, we used to meet on Friday nights, uh, which is a little tougher time to get people out. Of. Eventually, we started meeting on Saturday mornings. The congregation has grown quite a bit uh, over the last 10 years. I mean, we're not breaking any records. We're about 90 people today, which is pretty good for a Messianic synagogue. And um, the important thing is we've, we've just had some great people come in to this faith community. And uh, some of you are here, and you've been here with us for eight, 10 years, something like that. And, and the Lord just keeps bringing in terrific people, Jewish and non-Jewish, and, and things are just uh, really, really good right now. So I feel tremendously thankful for God's amazing grace and all the wonderful people, all of y'all that are here and, and uh, that come and support this work and, and just drink up what God is doing here. It's been a great year, 2023. I'm thankful for all of you and for all the things that he's done this last year and, and just in previous years. And uh, it isn't easy to describe what changed since that time that I described. Um, I've tried to explain it through my books, through the iPath, uh, uh, though the stories, or through the stories and the characters that I've encountered along the way. But I can tell you this, that one thing that, that changed at that time for me was my focus. And my focus was no longer on myself, but my focus was not on what I must do, but my focus was on what he has already done and what he's continually doing. And that's been the way that I've been preaching ever since. That's what I want people who come here to, to get, because I think that that's the, the cornerstone of the gospel. It's not about what you must do, but it's about what he has already done for you and, and will continue to do if you keep your eyes on him. And, you know, our way of serving together is unique because God created Israel as a peculiar people. He gave us a law. He gave us customs. And we're not, we're not going to abolish any of that. We're not going to, well, maybe some things. <laughs> but but yeah, we don't meet on Sunday, we meet on Saturday. You know, our festivals are, you, you know, they're God-given and, and the rest of the world doesn't uh, understand them, they don't keep them, and, and, and so we have our, our Sabbaths, our festivals, our diet, our humor, our, you know, just our culture is, is unique and that was God's intent to create a peculiar people from that people that one people to bring forth the savior of all people. Amen. Praise God. Amen. And there was a time where in that first generation of apostles, the Jewish apostles and the Jews from Israel that went out to preach the gospel to the Gentiles, they came together, Jew and Gentile, one and Messiah. There was no organized religion at those times. There was no quote unquote, uh, Church. There wasn't this church or that church. There were no denominations. It was just the Yeshua movement. And I think that that's what God is doing now. It's the heart of the Messianic Jewish movement. It's a Yeshua movement for Jewish and non-Jewish people who are just focused on what Yeshua has already done and what he's continuing to do now and forever. For us, for Israel, for our communities, our families. It's not a religion. And we're not on some religious trip. But we're always looking at him. Because that's where the power is. I close with this. Thank you for letting me have a, um, a cough moment. <laughs> and thanks, Rob, for, for filling in. I have no idea what you said. I hope it was good. <laughs> How do you do? <laughs>
But it's been, a, it's been a great final service, and I couldn't think of a better scripture to close with. 1 Corinthians 1, 23, 24, but we proclaim Messiah crucified. That's our message. That's, you know, Paul said, look, I'm a doctor of the law, man. I know it all. I was raised at the feet of Gamaliel, okay? They had me chasing down Messianic Jews and throwing them in prison and torturing them and killing them. So don't tell me about the Torah. Uh, I know all about that, but my message is the crucified Messiah. Don't think Paul was like no longer a Torah keeper or anything. He is, by the way. I, I guarantee he still ate kosher, kept the Sabbath and the feast and stuff. But he knew that that wasn't where the power was. That's just what he was called to. And you don't have to do it that way. We do, and we thank God for people who are with us. But not everybody does. Fine. We have a message that we proclaim, and it's this is it, and we believe it. The crucified Messiah, a stumbling block to Jewish people, foolishness to the Gentiles, but to those who are called, Jewish and Greek, Messiah, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Shabbat Shalom, Happy New Year. <laughs> Praise the Lord. We're going to say a bracha over the wine and bread. I got uh, my son David, my daughter Ruthie, my older son Joey's up there running the AV with with Sue, and and, uh, and then uh, my daughter Rachel is is uh, away for a few days. But we've been having a good time as a family. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, hamotzi lechem min haaretz. Amen. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from you. Amen. Amen. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, borei peri hagafen. Amen. Amen. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, creator of the fruit of the vine. Shabbat shalom, everybody. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Please rise for the ironic benediction. Isa Adonai Pana Melecha Yasem Lecha Shalom. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and bring you peace. Peace, prosperity, good health, and a happy new year. In Yeshua's name, amen. amen. Shalom.